you know, they're, they're limited in their capacity, especially the anaerobic ones. Anytime you're doing an interval in swimming, you dive and you do a, a, a sprint, you can't maintain that sprint for, you know, 100 meters like you could for 25, or for 500 meters as you could for 25 meters, right? You just can't because it's a different energy system. And in water, you know, as any swim coach would tell you, the mechanics of creating as much laminar flow and being as smooth in the water as possible so that your energy is transferred that direction and not cavitating too much and things like that, those will come critical. So I think the, the fitness coach is very good at the second two, which is the metabolic conditioning and the muscle conditioning. I think the swim coach becomes critical in terms of the mechanic and the mindset. And if you're a coach that can do both, I think you're a very valuable asset. Welcome to the Purposeful Fitness with Coach Ola, where I dive in deeper into holistic health and fitness topics that would help you stay inspired, motivated, and dedicated to living a purposeful fit life while pursuing for the Akhira. Hi everyone and welcome to episode number 57 with Coach Ola. Today's guest is Fabio Kumana, who is the Director of Continuing Education for NASM and a faculty member at San Diego State University and the University of California, San Diego. He was the origin developer of ACE, Integrated Fitness Training IFT model, and it led development on their personal training educational workshop. Fabio has a wealth of experience from workshops as a colleague's head coach strength and conditioning coach, and club manager for Club One. Certifications are ACE, ACSM, NASM, and NSCA. I am an ACE certified personal trainer, and I've attended his workshop at IDEA Conference in Northern Virginia. So having him on for the second time is such a huge honor, and I'm super grateful for this opportunity. In today's episode, we dived into depth about the mechanics behind dry land training for swimmers. Specifically, we focus on lower body extremities, deadlift, and we also talked about the three pillars of training, myofascial tissue, and of course, so much more. So if you are a swimmer, if you are a strength and conditioning coach, or you simply love to hear the science behind training, this episode is for you. I also would love to invite you and your family to my virtual social media campaigns, Swim for Akhira, which will start with six webinars lined up starting from August 21st. The campaign is to bring further diversity into the swimming industry for Muslim women, and we will have the replay. So if you want to attend the real life webinars, real time, make sure that you visit the website, linktree.com dash slash BeFit for Akhira. Also, you can come to my social media handle at BeFit for Akhira where you can find the details. I cannot wait to have you on, to come, to join the conversation. Without further ado, let's welcome our guest for today, Fabio. Hi, Fabio. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Well, thank you for inviting me back. Yeah, you're welcome. Everyone who's watching and listening to this, this is like our second chance, and I'm so grateful to have him on. So thank you very much. If you don't mind telling us, what are your current projects or updates? since anything else new. <laughs> uh, well, given the situation we're in, I, you know, obviously I teach at the university, so my biggest challenge has been, you know, migrating all my coursework online. And lectures is not very challenging because we have a lot of resources available for us, but it's all my practical stuff. So I have to go into, we have a, a small gym that we use for educational purposes. The only one there I go by myself and I basically set up my camera and everything and I film. And then I'm editing all my video. So we're doing corrective exercise all the way through Olympic lifting because I teach a course in those, in those areas. And there's a theory portion to it, but we also have a practical portion. And it's pretty challenging to do that without people actually having, you know, people to practice, without actually having tools to practice on. Yeah. So that's been kind of occupying a lot of my time. And then, of course, I work with a few other companies like NASM and Orange Theory and you know, really helping them uh, put a lot of content online, you know, especially when people are confined to their homes, looking at, you know, body weight training. So finding kind of creative ways to, you know, keep people engaged, number one. Best thing I found is creating little training blocks and, you know, where they could just kind of drop them in, in you know, at any point of time in their day without demanding too much because it's so easy just to push things back right now. And then, you know, obviously, 
doing a few other little odds and ends, helping people out and stuff. But, you know, I think we're just trying to make the best use of the time we have, right? Yes. And I like mentioned earlier, I do work at George Mason. That's the same thing we're going through right now. We're like lots of our clients, we have to record videos for them and now like create content for students. So it's a definitely a challenge, but you're able to attend the university. Like they allow you to go in. Well, no, it's only, I'm only allowed to go by myself. So the university is technically closed. So when I go, there's only about three or four people that actually access that room. Mm-hmm. So we have to just coordinate with each other to make sure that no one is, there, you know, we're all going by ourselves. They don't want it, you know, we're keeping our social distancing. Mm-hmm. So we're abiding to all the rules. We're just basically, you know, being very precautious about things. And, you know, fortunately it's allowing us to get a little bit of work done because I said, you know, one of the courses I teach without a practical component, there's really not much I can teach. So this is one way to get around it. But as I said, we have to follow, you know, they, we have to follow very specific guidelines in order to be able to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. And yes, it's a challenge for all of us. And so, you know, the conversation is changing a little bit from last time I, re- I recorded this episode with you. And we mentioned how like now I'm, I'm all about swimming and I want to talk to the swimmers as well. So what are the three pillars of training and why is that important for us to focus on, on them doing training? And how can that be related to swimming as well? Well, you know, we talk about, we always talk about the three pillars of training and I, you know, I I usually don't bring up, but I also consider there's a fourth pillar of training and I think it becomes very important in swimming. It's mindset, right? Yes. Yes. So when you're in the gym, you know, you've got a variety of equipment, you've got interaction with other people. When you're on a team, a team, you know, like a soccer team, rugby team, you've got the, the camaraderie of teammates. Swimming is a solitary sport, right? So I think there's a very important element of mindset. So I'd say for swimming, you have to almost bring in that fourth the fourth pillar, which I call mindset. But the other three are movement mechanics, you know, the, the metabolic conditioning and the muscle conditioning. And, you know, so I think in all modalities of training, you know, whether it's swimming or land-based sports, sometimes I don't think coaches and, and uh, the athletes or whether they're true athletes or just recreational enthusiasts give enough consideration to some of them. Everyone thinks about the muscle, you know, so, I got to think about, you know, I've got to make my muscles bigger, stronger. You know, if I've got stronger muscles, I can pull far, I can pull harder in the water and I get a more of a power stroke. But we also have to appreciate there's an energy system that's driving that. So you have to appreciate how the energy systems work. And, you know, they're, they're limited in their capacity, especially the anaerobic ones. Anytime you're doing an interval in swimming, you dive and you do a, a, a sprint, you can't maintain that sprint for, you know, 100 meters like you could for 25 or well, for 500 meters as you could for 25 meters, right? You just can't because it's a different energy system. And in water, you know, as any swim coach would tell you, the mechanics of creating as much laminar flow and being as smooth in the water as possible so that your energy is transferred that direction and not cavitating too much and things like that, those will become critical. So I think the, the fitness coach is very good at the second two, which is the metabolic conditioning and the muscle conditioning. I think the swim coach becomes critical in terms of the mechanic and the mindset. And if you're a coach that can do both, I think you're a very valuable asset. Yes, and I miss it so much and it's so hard like now. But it's so true because when I became a certified swim instructor and teaching people how to swim, it was very a challenge for me because it, like I'm new to it, I'm new to the whole swimming world. So for me, when I found someone like I know how to swim and find my balance and all that stuff and I'm still working on it. But when I'm teaching like an adult and they have the whole mechanic like, upside down and it's really hard to find the balance I had to put like my personal hat um hat on like you know the stability in the water and like why it's important and I had to tell the, the student like it's really important for you to do on land work like I can't just expect you to be in water and then bam like you're gonna learn how to swim <laughs> yeah well you know I mean I remember when I was a kid and I was swimming I mean yeah getting people to be buoyant and, and maintain that position is so critical you know and it's it's Obviously, buoyancy in water is very different than land because of the upward force of water. But, you know, it, it's, it can be helpful if you can get someone to maybe using a stability ball to help them maintain their balance and becoming aware of what muscle groups are involved to keep you in that balanced position. And then that can be transferred into, into water. And that's a fundamental of swimming, right? I mean, I remember one of the very first things I was taught is, you know, here's a kickboard. Well, first of all, we started going to the wall and you got to get your body this way and be able to kick without kind of, you know, dropping your body into that position. So, I mean, it was yeah. all, I just remember this. I mean, this is when I, I'm going back years now, you know, when I was, cause I started competitive swimming when I was five. Right. And, you know, I transitioned off to, off to swimming for a few years. I transitioned to water polo cause I, I, I was more of a team dynamic type person. I liked more of the team sports, but you know, swimming helped me be successful in water polo cause I had that, that strong background. 
you know, and I came from a family of swimmers. My mom was the quintessential swimming manager. She wasn't a coach. She was a manager that took us to, to practice four days a week and we hated it. But <laughs> I look back and, you know, it was a good thing because, you know, it definitely yeah. taught us things. But, you know, the other concern you've got to worry about is the repetitive nature of swimming. You've got mm -hmm. to watch, you know, especially people doing freestyle and butterfly, you know, all that internal rotation. You've got to watch, you know, the integrity of the shoulder. So one thing I didn't know back then, and of course, now that I've learned more about the human body, that I would definitely, you know, include in any swimming program that I, you know, if I was working with someone is definitely the shoulder mechanics, shoulders, you know, scapular stability, glenohumeral mobility, and doing a lot of rotator cuff work just to maintain that integrity in the shoulder to avoid any potential overuse in the shoulder, which can happen frequently in swimming. Yeah. And actually that's uh, the idea 2020 that I saw you in this year, I attended Pete Holman's session and I was like the only one that I kept asking because he talked about the shoulder, the session about shoulder and stuff. And I kept asking like, swimming, what about swimming? Like, you know, bring it back to swimming. And it's yeah. really important because like it's really used in, in that sport. Absolutely. So, yeah, and so like actually it's a very good segue to the myofascial tissue because over swimming or doing anything can tear and apart because I felt it in my own body when I or when I swim too much. So would you please tell us about the myofascial tissue and the, speaking about it in general, how can we take care of it to keep up with like our fitness journeys and swimming as well? You know, so myofascia is this term that a lot of people are becoming familiar with. You know, we hear about it a lot in our conversations, but the question I always ask is, you really understand what it is you know a lot of people they talk about oh i use the foam roller and i said why and it's well it relaxes my muscles i'm like does it really you know because it's not really it, it can help but it's not intended to do that because the fascia is is even though it's made up of the same components as your muscle it's designed and it functions very differently i mean first of all muscle you know if i take a piece of paper for example you know muscle if muscle can give me support this way, so if I pull these two ends, the muscle can give me, it has the integrity to resist that. But if I do this to the muscle, it gives me no support. But fascia is different. And fascia is built in what we call a polyhedron. It's like a three-dimensional structure, which means fascia can support this, but it can also support that. So it functions very differently. The best way to define fascia is that it's your scaffolding of your body, and it's everywhere. Just like we put scaffolding around a building, it's what allows you to move. People think it's my skeleton that allows me to keep my shape. Well, not necessarily. Your skeleton just keeps you upright. It's the fascia that allows you to constantly move and be able to chain, you know, lengthen your arm and bring the arm and take this arm back there. And it's always this fascia that's always remodeling itself. And we start to learn a lot more about it, right? Fascia, the biggest challenge with fascia is that it's highly reactive. It has perhaps the greatest density of receptors in the tissue outside of your eye, outside of the retina of the eye, which means it's very reactive to, you know, mechanical forces like Shortening, lengthening, pressure, compression, things of that nature, which means the fascia is constantly remodeling. And fascia is under the skin, right? And it's also inside your muscle. It's everywhere. So one thing that we have to appreciate is that when we talk about, you know, a swimmer needs to have a nice range. So if I'm swimming and I'm going to do a nice long stroke, a lot of people think if I take my arm up and do this, so for example, if I was doing backstroke and I take my arm up this way and I have a restriction, a lot of people instinctively think it's limitations on the front side of the body. That's not necessarily true because if you look at your fascia, especially around the inside the muscle, it's layered out. It's 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 found in a lot of layers, right? And think about my hands here. So on the front side, as my arm goes back in the backstroke, the fascial membranes are doing this, but on the back side, they're doing the exact opposite. They're shortening. And if I had an adhesion, so I take pieces of paper and I say, "Listen, take these two pieces of paper, put them parallel to each other, and if they're parallel to each other, look how easily they glide against each other. That would be good movement." But what if I took one piece of paper and made it crumpled? Now you'd have a little bit of friction, right? There'd be a little shear force, a little resistance. Well, that's what your fascia does. It can create what we call an adhesion. Sometimes we call it a knot. And fascial adhesions can happen very quickly from immobilization, overuse, trauma, you name it. It's just happening constantly, right? So if I'm sitting here talking to you for the next hour and I'm hunched over, my fascia in my chest is going to start to aggregate into a bit of a hole. Right? Why? Because it's supporting that position. So I got to move it to try and do what? Much like you iron a shirt, you got to get those creases out with a little bit of pressure. So fascial techniques, when we do, you know, most people think of foam rolling, right? One of the classic things there is we're using a mechanical force of a device like a ball or roller, much like you would be ironing a shirt to kind of get those adhesions, those kind of creases out of your shirt, that's kind of aggregation of, of fascial tendrils. We're trying to alleviate them, right? 
Now that's one way, mechanical compression. So most of us are familiar with compression where we take a device, put our body on it, either we push a ball against our chest or we put our body on a foam roller and we move. But you might remember Michael Phelps in 2016. He showed up and all of a sudden people looked at all these big circles he had on his body and they said, what the hell is that? And most people call it cupping. It's actually a more advanced version. It was called myofascial decompression or myofascial distraction. This was done at the University of California, San Francisco. And what they did is they used, much like cupping, they used a, a pneumatic device to actually physically lift. So they took, I'm going to use my hand as an example. They took that device and they lifted the superficial fascia away from the muscle underneath. And then they had Michael Phelps stretch out. And what was happening is when your fascia is tight, it's like taking plastic wrap around a meatball, put it in the microwave, and you know how that plastic wrap shrinks around the meatball? The meatball can't move? Well, think of Michael Phelps' muscles as the meatball. He couldn't move, he was tight, so he needs to expend every ounce of energy to get a nice power stroke, not to overcome resistance in his own body because his fascia is tight. So what they did is they did a decompression part of it. So what they did is they lifted this fascia off the muscle, and then they allowed him to move his muscle. They did a bunch of exercises, and then when they released it, they actually found that there was some space in there that was not impeding his ability to actually get a nice long reach on his stroke. So he was expending more energy into his power stroke and less energy having to overcome his own friction within his body, so to speak. So myofascial techniques have a huge impact on swimmers. And I'd say every athlete that, you know, if I'm going to swim, obviously my shoulders need a lot of mobility. So I'd be working the front, the side, the underside, the back. I'd be working all that area because just like the meatball, when the plastic wrap is shrunk on the meatball, you don't just pull it in one direction. If you want that meatball to move three directions, you've got to pull the plastic wrap in all directions. So I want to get your fascia all the way around your shoulder. So if I'm going to do some fascial techniques, I'm going to get the chest into the lats, the teres, and posterior deltoids. I want to get all over. That way I'm going to give you the ability to get the maximum reach. So you expend energy moving, not fighting your own friction or resistance within the body. Yeah. And like, I'm smiling a lot because number one, like my, um, the cubbing is actually part of like, from my faith it's like people, a lot of the muslims are like excited about it because that's like what the, the prophet muhammad um peace upon him like used to tell us to do so when michael Phelps like was all on it everyone was on it like all the muslims like oh my gosh like it's part of our faith so yeah and that's something that's recommended for us to do as well like you know it also helps with the spiritual healing I'm like sure. yeah like pain i mean there's so yeah. many there's <laughs> an endless list of benefits that we could share when people say, what, is myofascial, what are the benefits of myofascial techniques? I would tell you that we can sit and create a laundry list. Because it, it doesn't, it's not just physiological. It would be emotional, it would be psychological. Because, I mean, pain. Pain is manifested from many different sources. It is a physiological sensation, but the cause of it can be many things. You know, because, for example, when you're stressed, you go into contraction. And over time, that can create overactivity in the muscle, and that can lead to pain. So you know, myofascial techniques can also you know, phys physically release tissue but that can have a psycho-emotional psycho impact. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's holistic, completely holistic. Yeah, and like also with breathing, because when I attended Helen, Helen's session when the, about the breathing for people, especially like with trauma healing, because when you're in so much trauma, like emotional and stuff like that, that can really tighten up the body and then everything is just screwed over. <laughs> um, so for, for someone who is still not understanding the lower extremities, movements and mechanics uh, would you please tell us on the importance of doing the squat correctly and how can we work on it for that part so you know we use the word squat a lot and you know one thing to appreciate is that a squat is just an exercise there's really nothing functional about a squat because if you think about it in life when we bend down to pick things up our hands are at our sides so as if you're really comparing what is functional, the exercise would be a deadlift. Now, I don't want to get people get intimidated by the word deadlift, right? It's a bend and lift pattern. It's where you're bending down to pick something off the ground. And in exercise, the closest exercise we have that is really a deadlift. So I always, when people talk about a squat, I don't want to teach a squat right now because one of the additional requirements of the squat is that your hands have to be up here technically, where you put a bar either in front of your chest or behind your chest. That's what defines a squat. When people say, well, I'm just holding something in my hand. Well, it's not really a squat. That's more like a farmer's carry or a deadlift. It's a variation of a deadlift. So why I don't like to teach the squat first is because to get the bar up here, especially if you're putting it behind the bar, it requires a lot of opening up your chest and having a lot of thoracic mobility 
And if you don't have it, the way the body works is if you don't have movement in one segment, the easiest thing is to borrow from an adjacent segment. So for example, I'm here, and if I want to basically put a bar into this position, the challenge I have is if I don't have enough thoracic mobility, I'm gonna get it out of my, low sp my lumbar spine and my hips. That means my lumbar spine is going to more of an arch. And that's not a healthy thing when you are squatting, especially if you've got load on top of that spine. So I always try and teach the movements with your hands free. So call it a body weight squat if you want to, but I want to teach you with your hands here rather than up here. We'll work on getting you to that point. My simple philosophy is you earn the right to progress. So I always teach the deadlift and then I teach the front squat. And then when you can demonstrate that you can put your hands behind your head, like holding a bar, and you can do it without any compensation. In other words, you're not borrowing movement out of your low back. Then I'll teach you how to do an Olympic squat or a power squat, wherever you want to go to. But anyhow, getting to the mechanics. So understanding that the body always looks for ways to get things done. So we're victims of a lifestyle where we spend a lot of time sitting in chairs. And it's a simple thing. You use it or you lose it, right? We've heard that before. So one of the biggest problems that we have is that when you're going to do a bend and lift, and I'm just going to call it a squat just because bend and lift is such a tongue, it's a tongue, it gets my tongue tied, right? So I'm just going to call the word squat just for the sake of our conversation. But Ole, here's one thing that I appreciate is if I'm going to teach this squat pattern or this bend and lift pattern, it requires a lot of mobility at the ankle and requires a lot of mobility at the hips, all right? Believe it or not, we used to hear people say, when you squat, you should never let your knees go forward. Now, that was an original research study done in 1978. And it has since been disproved that your knees are supposed to go forward. It's just a matter of when and how they go forward, right? So if you're starting to squat, you should never start by just simply dropping your hips because that'll just drive your knee forward immediately. What you should be doing is hinging your hips and letting your hips fall backwards. Then you drive the shin bone forward. And yes, the shin bone may go forward and it might be sitting over the front of your toes. It really depends on how long your limbs are and how small your feet are. Someone who's got really long legs and short feet, they might have their knee way over their toe. And I just tell people, go look at the best lifters in the world. Go look at the Olympic lifters when they're in the bottom portion of their snatches or their clean and jerks. If you look at them, you'll see their knees are way past their toes. And they're doing extremely heavy weights, right? So we've got to dispel that first notion that you know, your knees should never go forward. Because here's the problem. If you try and keep your knees back, that means you're going to squat like this, which means you're going to drop your thighs backwards. But if I tell you to get down lower, now you have to bring your chest towards the floor. And we call that the T position. That means your shin bone looks like that, and your trunk looks like that. It resembles the letter T, right? Now, if you come out of that squat, I want you to think about this. If I'm coming out of the squat, my hips are going to be going that way, but my spine is going that way. Your spine and hips are going in opposite directions. That's putting a lot of shear forces, a lot of friction at the base of your, your vertebra and the hips. And then also, if I, my spine is doing a rotational movement, if you look at my two fingers, call that finger number one, finger number two, finger number one is actually moving faster than finger number two because it's covering more distance in the same amount of time. And if your spine is coming out of the squat like that, where you're in this position, as you come out of the squat, your spine is rotating vertically. That means your vertebra are moving at different speeds. That means you're creating shear forces between the vertebra. That's a very unhealthy thing. And that's why we saw a lot of back injuries when people were squatting in the 1980s and 1990s and early 2000s. So when researchers revisited the squat, they, created, they found that the way to eliminate that back injury is to actually squat into what they call the figure four position. So if you look at my hands, if this is your shin bone, and that's your trunk. And then we take your thigh in between. It kind of looks like the number four. So they call it a figure four position. Now, it's not a perfect four. Ladies tend to be a little bit more bent over because they have longer legs relative to their trunks. So men tend to be a little bit more parallel. Now, when you look at this position, I'm coming out of the squat. Everything is moving vertically. So that's much safer. So I have to teach that. So the first thing I teach you to do is when I want to teach you to squat is I'm going to look at how you're going to stand. Now, I don't really care how you stand. Just understand this. If, if you go with your feet narrow, if you choose to go to narrow, that's called the width of your hips. If you want to get your hands to the floor to pick up something off the ground, you're going to need your tibia to go forward a lot. So that shin bone is going to have to fall forward a lot. That means you have to have a lot of ankle mobility. Now, ankle mobility must happen without the feet moving. Your foot needs to remain stable when you're doing a squat. And that's usually the number one error made on a squat 
is most people don't even bother to think about their feet. They go into the squat and they may start like this. And by the time they've done their first rep, their feet really look like this. Because the compensation is if I can't move forward in one plane, I move into other planes. So some people do what? They go wider with their stance. So they may start into the squat with a very wide position. And that tells me right off the bat, you're really compensated because you're moving into a different plane to compensate for the fact that your shin bones can't go forward because you don't have enough ankle mobility. And the problem is, do I have a, so someone says, is it bad to have my knees wide? No, but just understand, now you've changed the angle between your shin bone and your femur that puts a lot of stresses into the knee. The best way to align your joints is this way. So if your femur, your thigh bone was directly over your shin bone, that would create a nice straight squat. But if you go wider, you're gonna create more of that. So you're gonna have that little bend and that puts a lot more stress in the knee. So you have to choose. So the first thing I look at is how do you set yourself up for the squat? If you're going wider, then theoretically, it tells me that I probably want to help you work with a little bit more ankle mobility so that you don't have to go as wide. Now we're teaching the squat. And the first thing I wanna teach you how to do is to sit back. Most people just drop their hips straight down. And if I drop my hips straight down, that's what happens. My femur, my thigh bone, just kind of pushes the knee out like that, which means I'm squatting a lot with my quads. You wanna use the big muscles on the back for two reasons. Number one, your glute is the strongest muscle. You use it. Number two is if you fall backwards, if you actually sit back into the squat, you actually put a load into your hamstrings and that actually helps stabilize your knee. So I've got to teach you to sit back. But when you sit back, you can't just sit back like you're doing on a toilet. Because when you and I sit in a chair or toilet, we sit back, but then our trunk falls over like that. We just lean forward. You're going to end up in that position. Now, if you're just getting out of a chair, that's not a bad position. But if I put 200 pounds on your, shoulder, on your shoulders right now, and your spine has to rotate like that to come out, that's a lot of forces. So I want to see more of this position rather than that position. So I have to teach you how to gradually lower but making sure that you're keeping that position somewhat parallel. Pretty hard to do here. I mean, it would be so much easier if we were in a, in a gym together and I could actually show you. But I'd say the easiest thing for your listeners to appreciate is, you know, have them perform as a warm up, what I call a bend and lift pad. So what I generally use, I take two tennis balls, anything light. You can use two lacrosse balls, you can use two cones, you can use two pencils, whatever you have accessible. Put them on either side of your foot, and I'm going to say to you now, I want you to bend down, pick those up, but I want you to imagine they're really heavy. So we're going to see what kind of bend and lift pattern you do. Because that's my concern, is if you look good three quarters of the way, but that last 25% is where you have to compromise and compensate, that's where you may get hurt. And so in real life, I would tell you, you probably want to avoid that, that movement. So how can we fix it? Well starts with the ankle. If I can give you more ankle mobility, you can avoid this in the lowered position because if I need to get your hands to the floor and this doesn't go forward, the only option is to bring that down. Now you're in that T position, which means when you come out of this, your spine is doing that, and that's gonna be what causes the back injury because not only are you bringing it up, a lot of people bring their chest up first and they really arch their backs, and that's not a very effective way to protect your spine. So I've gotta teach you how to get in that position. So I just tell people, we got to work on mobilizing the ankle. So I get a, a ball under their feet. I stretch their calf muscles. I get in the front of the shin. I work a lot of that lower limb to get more ankle mobility. A lot of people don't even think about it. If you were to ask your, your, your listeners, how many of you think about your ankle mobility in a squat? Probably you'd probably find very few of them would say, oh yeah, I do. Most of them are thinking about their back and their hips and which muscles they're targeting. They're not thinking about the ankles. You know, they're worried about their knees falling in. Remember, the knees fall in because a lot of times of what's happening at the ankles. If the ankles collapse inward, which is a compensation, because if I can't move in this direction, I move into other directions. That's the way the body finds movement. And if your ankles collapse, your knees are just going to follow. So we shouldn't be teaching you to say, keep your knees straight. That's the consequence. We should be addressing the cause. The cause is a lack of ankle mobility or it's a lack of hip mobility. You've got to work, you got to kind of figure those things out. That's why a trainer is a good person to work with. Because right? the trainer can help you identify these things and put you on a path of corrective exercise so that, number one, you'll squat more efficiently, which means you'll be stronger. But number two, you're also not going to get hurt. Because one squat won't get you hurt. It's 10,000 squats done badly will probably create the injury. And that's why I think there's value in working with a strength coach or a personal trainer because he or she is going to recognize these shortcomings, these movement compensations, if you want to call them, and they're gonna help you correct them. 
And so it starts with ankle mobility. Then I need to teach you how to sit back more to engage the posterior chain. But the most important thing is when you drop into that squat position, I just tell people, take a look. If you've got a mirror, look sideways into the mirror and look at the orientation. Imagine me holding a stick along the length of your shin bone and the length of your trunk. And if you're seeing more of this, which is very common in the gym, you are an injury waiting to happen. So I need to break you out of this and get you more towards that, where your shin bone does go forward because the ankle permits it. And that way you don't have to drop your chest as much. You can kind of stay in that position. But there's also one last thing. Imagine I have a stick as you're dropping the squat placed along your spine. What I want to see is it making three points of contact. It should be touching between your butt cheeks, your sacrum, touching between your shoulder blades on your thoracic spine and touching the back of your head. And that natural curve in your low back should be there or it should be almost disappearing. The two things you don't want to see is a rounding of your low back. So we call it the butt wink. When people drop into a deep squat and they tuck their butt underneath, that creates a lot of rounding. The spine inflection is very weak. Number two, we also don't want to see an increased arch. So your spine from when you're standing into that position, the three points of contact, the back of your head, between your shoulder blades and your tailbone should ideally remain in a nice straight line. That's a nice strong spine. And that's the way to avoid a back injury in a squat. Sorry, I've gone a little longer, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. It's actually very interesting because as soon as I, I entered the swimming world and like becoming better at it, when I actually had to work my, my breast stroke technique because it was completely wrong, I had to work on the land, you know, walk like a duck kind of thing, the feet here. That was like on ankle I had to focus on. And then number two, my aquatic director at Mason said, that's why a lot of people who do the breaststroke tend to have knee pain in the long run. And you're right, because like the upper body, the shoulders, I noticed a lot of swimmers also like rounded forward, like live guards yeah. and swimmers. And I'm like, why? <laughs> so, well, but that's an important point. I think you make an important point. So it's, it yeah. breaststroke requires a lot of external rotation mm -hmm. in the lower extremity. So as you can do the frog kick, yep. a lot of external rotation. And if that's all you do, all right, you become very tight on the, the what we call the lateral rotators. So now you go stand up and you're standing outside of the pool and you naturally see a little bit of that external rotation. So swimmers have to balance that. Unfortunately, it's not just swimming. Every sport, I would say, I don't think there's a perfect sport that will create perfect balance in your body. Every sport demands certain movements that can sometimes create imbalance in the body. And I think you just address them, you hit the nail on the head in, in breaststroke, that excessive amount of, because as you're coming into the frog kick, you're doing a lot of external rotation. And that creates what? A lot of mobility on the inside of your thighs but a lot of tightness on the outside of your thighs and if a, if a swimmer doesn't work to maintain balance that could become a problem same thing you do see a lot of that rounding shoulders like a lot of female swimmers have those rounded forward shoulders because everything is a power stroke with internal rotation right the backstroke is about the only one who does external rotator but the butterfly yeah the and the breaststroker are all doing internal rotation mm -hmm. and that creates a lot of overactivity on the front side and that's why you see a lot of that rounded shoulders so it would be good for those swimmers to do a lot of backstroke, you know, as a part of their, you know, offload training to do what find balance. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Swimming, just like every other sport, creates some imbalances. And I think a good swimmer or a good coach recognizes that and spends time maybe in the water or land trying to offset those tendencies because you're doing countless hours in those positions. And it is a user to loser, right? If I keep doing movements with my arms in, and think about it, our entire life is also like this. Right? We type on our keyboards, we on our phones. So we spend a lot of time internally rotated. I'd love to get you into a little bit of external rotation. So that would be a good thing to recognize. So I think you hit the nail on the head that swimming can create some partial you know, distortions, but it's not just swimming. Every sport can do that. And it's a good coach that recognizes that and creates part of their programming as a way to ensure that they're maintaining balance on either side of the joint. Yes, and I lost my thoughts. But also with like the flutter kicks, like when it comes to the freestyle, right? In the back circle, the same thing with the legs. It's very like, because with my students, a lot of them don't know how to like kick it, right? And that does impact the imbalance. So the last few questions, what is the difference between a lumbar spine extension and a torso hinge? And how is that important for the deadlift as well? So, well, lumbar, I, I think we need to clarify, lumbar extension and lumbar hyperextension are two mm -hmm. things that we need to clarify. So, Anytime you're in flexion, so if I bend forward, so let's say I'm going to stand and I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to go sit, say, sit on the chair. 
as I sit in the chair, I get a little bit of flexion of my trunk because my trunk comes forward a little bit. So I'm kind of doing that. If I bring myself back to normal, back to that position, that's called lumbar extension. That's a very normal thing. We should all be able to do that. What I'm worried about is when people go into hyperextension. So think of a classic person who's lying on the floor doing what's called a Superman. So the Superman exercise is where the person lies on their belly and they bring their arms up and they bring their back up, right? So they might say, well, that's good for butterfly because look at the motion, we're creating that, you know, that arching. Now, granted, when you're staying vertically, that hyperextension of the spine is dangerous because that puts a lot of compression into the discs, right? However, when you're lying down, there's not as much pressure on your spine because gravity is not really playing a role there, but it's still not good. So lumbar hyperextension is something that we need to be very careful of, right? So I would say if you're teaching your, your you know, athletes how to, you know, because again, buoyancy requires them to maintain good lumbar extension, not necessarily hyperextension. Because a good butterflyer gets a lot of that movement out of their hips, right? So as they're coming up to do their butterfly stroke, there's a little bit of lumbar hyperextension, but a lot of it is coming out of the hips. The hips are propelling the torso up, right? So you're gonna get a lot more power out of your hips than you will get out of your low back. So a good butterflyer is someone who gets that drive to bring their whole body up, bring the chest and arms out of the water. That power is coming out of their hips. Nice forceful kick drives the hips and the hips can drive the trunk out of the water, right? Or drive the upper part of the trunk out of the water rather than just arching the back. Because that arching the back, as I said, it's needed, but it's not the best solution, right? So that would be something I'd want to avoid. So if I've got people doing land-based training and I'm teaching them how to get that motion, like on a stability ball, and I might be teaching that hip hinge, that hip hinge or that hip drive that brings them up, I want to make sure I would say the movement comes out of hips. So I would use an analogy of your hips as a bucket of water filled to the very top, right? So I've got this container that's filled with water right to the top. And what we call an anterior tilt is where I tilt it forward so the water falls out the front. And the posterior tilt is where the water falls out the back. Now in swimming, a lot of hip movement, you've got to move water out the front and the back continuously, right? So I want to teach you how to move your hips. So by creating a posterior tilt, an easy way to just say, let's do a reach behind our head, right? Now, if you're standing up and do that reach behind your head, or if you're lying down, and you do it all just out of the low back, in other words, the hips don't move, you're going to feel a lot of tightness, a lot of tension in your low back. And you shouldn't be feeling that. First thing I want you to teach it is don't get out of your low back. Let's tilt the hips backwards. You can still reach backwards, but make it out of the hips. That way your lumbar spine feels like, hey, I didn't really have to arch that much. So I want to teach a lot of movement on hips. So when we're teaching lumbar movements, I want to make sure that the lumbar spine going through extension is, is, is okay, is acceptable. But the lumbar spine going into hyperextension where you're getting an increased arch in your low back, you might want to be cautious with that one. All right. The hip hinge is an exercise that we teach when we are teaching the deadlift, when you're teaching a kettlebell swing. It's very a little different from the squat. The squat is basically a mini version of the hinge because when you're teaching a hinge, what we do is we drive your butt backwards. We say, listen, all I want you to do is to throw the butt backwards as if you're going to sit in a chair. And generally, as the hips go backwards, your body feels like it's falling. So to counter that, the trunk comes forward. So the hinge is essentially the hips go backwards and as a reaction, the trunk comes forward, the head moves forward. We can do that on a deadlift, right? You'd never do that on a squat because if you were squatting and you let the trunk come forward, you got a bar right there that creates a lot of load on the spine. So on the squat, when we hinge, the trunk doesn't move as much, all right? It's just a little bit of a pelvic, it's pelvic and lumbar control in the hinge. But if I'm teaching just a hip hinge, I want you and say, okay, you're gonna stand here. And there's many ways I can teach you, but the idea is just pretend you're gonna sit in a chair. So imagine there's a chair behind you. Your feet are nice and stable, loading through three points of contact through the first metatarsal head, so under the big toe, fourth and fifth, and on the heel. Your weight is even distributed, you're nice and stable. I want you just to push your hips back. So you're just gonna kind of hinge, let you push your hips back. And don't try and force the loading, just allow the body to do what naturally happens. In other words, as you hinge backwards, you're gonna see your knees bending a little bit. And as a result, your trunk's gonna come forward. That is the hip hinge. So I always teach a hip hinge. And so the movement just kind of looks like this. You're just kind of doing this motion right there. It's a nice gradual motion. There's no change in the position of your spine. Again, if we took that stick, we had our three points of contact, your spine would be here and we're just hinging. It would, just, it would maintain that position. We're just hinging right there. We're creating that hinge at the hips, all right? So that's 
creating pelvic movement. Then I want to teach you to come out of the hinge is drive your glutes, the big powerful muscles from behind, contract them, and that drives you back up to that vertical position. So that's the hip hinging motion, but there's no lumbar hyperextension there. As you're coming up, the lumbar spine is staying neutral. My concern is when people are in this position, I say, now, bring yourself up. What I do is I see them bring their chest up. So rather than driving the hips, they stop the movement by bringing their chest up. That creates a lumbar hyperextension. That's what I want to break with you. I want you to create the motion of your hips coming forward, not your chest going backwards. So if you're teaching the movement and you're practicing at home, again, get in front of the mirror, take a broomstick. Put a broomstick, put one hand above your head, one hand behind your, in the small of your back. Make the three points of contact. And as you drop into that hinge, you should keep that three points of contact and just learn to move from the hips. That would be a great way to get hip movement happening. Power from your hips. If you're in that load position, I say, now come on up. And the first thing you do is drive your chest up. That's going to create lumbar hyperextension. And that's what I'm trying to break you off. So that would be kind of the difference between the two is move from the hips, not from driving, coming up, driving from the chest, because that's going to create the lumbar hyperextension that we're trying to avoid. These are amazing points. And I'm like, taking notes like I'm studying, it's amazing. So if I were to summarize this in three top takeaway messages for our audience, I need your help. So number one is to focus on your- You talking about the hinge or? From this whole conversation. So when it comes okay. to- sure both swimming, squatting, deadlifting, and like our everyday living. And also as a Muslim who prays, you know, our prayers, like we tend to bend a lot and, and posture and stuff. And so the biggest takeaway message is work on your hip mobility, right? And then ankle mobility, which is needed for the squats, very big one. And then the upper body, the thoracic, the shoulders. Yeah, so if I was to go back, I'd say priority number one for all the, if I was to sum up all the movements you talked about, I would uh -huh. say probably number one is probably going to be the hip hinge. Hip hinge. Teach people how to hip hinge correctly, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not just the hinging down, it's the coming out of the hinge, and that's where we see a lot of breakdowns because people will initiate the movement by driving to their chest, and that creates the lumbar hyperextension. Engage, have them engage their tummy muscles to keep the lumbar spine stable and drive from the hips. So the first thing I would work just on the simple mechanics is the hip hinge and then coming out of the hinge to standing up where you want to just drive from the butt, drive up and bring everything back to normal. That would be the first exercise I would teach you. Then I want to move to your ankle mobility. So number two, if you want to be a better, let's call it a squatter, right? The way we live our life on land is we lose a lot of ankle mobility because we spend our lives in a shoe like this. I'm going to work on a lot of ankle mobility. And then three, I'm going to go work on a little bit of thoracic spine. I want to get a little bit of nice thoracic mobility. And the myofascial techniques will come into all of that. If you can use the myofascial around the hips, around the ankles, around the shoulder, and then you work on good mechanics. It goes back to the pillars that you talked about. Movement essentials, and you know, eventually then you can move into the metabolic and the muscle, but start with the movement. If I can teach you how to hip hinge correctly, give you more hip mobility, uh, sorry, more ankle mobility, more thoracic spine mobility, you will see how much easier it is for you to move. And you couple that with a bit of fascial techniques, bring, next thing you know, you're moving without restriction, you're minimizing pain, and you're gonna become more efficient at whatever you're doing. It makes you a better swimmer, better land-based athlete, better everything. So the third one is the myofascial technique? Well, okay, hip hinge number one. Hip hinge. Ankle mobility number two. Ankle. Thoracic mobility number three. But inside of all three of those would be myofascial techniques, all of them. Because oh, mobility right. is not just stretching. Mobility is teaching proper movement, but also the myofascial techniques will play into that mobility. So I want to mobilize those three sections. Thank you. So for, for our audience, one last reminder. you got to work on your mobility. And that is not just static stretching, but actual dynamic. And with along with the myofascial taking care of it, remember to focus on your hip hinge. And then number two is to focus on your ankle mobility. And then the last one is your thoracic. That's how I learn. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> That's why I attend those sessions at IDEA. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much for your time. Where can we, if we want to stay in touch with you, what's the best place? Uh, you know, kind of, you know, I, I get so saturated. I'll, I'll yeah. I'm still on Facebook. I don't post as much anymore just because I'm so inundated with work. Yes. But I don't have time to maintain, but that's probably the easiest way to find me, you know, just under my name on Facebook. You know, obviously some people find me through the university, San Diego State University, but, uh, or NASM. You know, but it's the easiest thing is just directly to Facebook. Be patient with me. I don't check my instant message or my Facebook that often. It's just I've become so overwhelmed with work that my social presence is something that's taken a bit of a backseat. 
I know how important it is. It's just a matter of delegating or managing my responsibilities, but that's probably the best place I can find it. Yes, and I understand how that feels. Like that's just also my life now. So, well, with the coronavirus epidemic, guys, if you're a swimmer and if you're not, this is the best time to work on your mobility. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for your time. You're welcome, Mother. Take care. It's Thank you for tuning in. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe today and leave a five-star review. You can also screenshot and share this episode with a family or a friend. Be strong. Be fit. Be fit for Akhirah.